Especially before you sing, it's like, I can't I know. breathe. I mean, even this is different. You know what? After the song, after you read the lesson, remember? You have to read the lesson. Yes. Are you going to use the book that's up there? You're gonna I took it up it. there. I took my paper up there. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah. Do you want to stay up there to sing that song with me, or do you want to come back to the microphone? I'll stay up there. You will? Okay. Because I always, every time I would forget. But I'll I'll stay up there. Okay, stay Do up I there. Just stand then up you there? better take your bulletin with you. It's up there. Oh, it is. I got two. Just oh, okay. To be on the yeah, you, you just stay standing there, and then I'll start playing the refrain once, and then you sing it, and he reads. That's fine. And then we just sing the refrain when the R shows. Sounds like it. Okay, we're good. I better get my robe. What time does it start? Five thirty. Oh, okay. But it's five twenty-three. Oh so my goodness! I better step on. <laughs>
Good evening and welcome to St. John's as we begin a new fall with the return of our three worship services. We especially welcome any of you who might be visiting and a very special welcome to our guest preacher, Reverend Otto Drydoppel. I think he needs absolutely no introduction because he's been here so many times that we have all come to know him and love him. Uh, but there is an update. This past summer, he retired as the chaplain at Moravian Hall Square. So we congratulate him and uh, wish him well in his new status. Pastor Scott and Jennifer were on vacation this past week and uh, were attending a wedding today in Pittsburgh. They will be back on Monday. Please be aware that masks are once again strongly encouraged for everyone in worship, regardless of your vaccination status. This change was made due to the increase in the rise of cases, COVID cases, and in an effort to keep our children safe and those who are most vulnerable. So we appreciate you following those guidelines. Rally day is tomorrow morning at 9.15 in the fellowship hall and Sunday school classes will be resuming for all ages, children through adults. Please carefully read the announcements in your bulletin as there are many activities that are returning after a long hiatus due to the pandemic. Luther League meets tomorrow after the 1030 service. Choirs for children and youth begin this week. There will be some uh, restrictions and accommodations due to the pandemic. The noon Bible study on Wednesday resumes in October. There will be an apple festival and also blessing of the animals. So for further information about all of these events, uh, please look at your bulletin. Uh, there's also the um, collection for brand new underwear for Appalachia is uh, continuing. Please put your donations in the boxes in the fellowship hall. And next weekend is Blanket Sunday, which uh, we collect monetary donations for Church World Service, and they use those funds for disaster relief, providing blankets for those in need. One announcement to correct in the bulletin the women of the East ELCA have decided to postpone their breakfast for next Saturday. So there will not be a breakfast next Saturday. Uh, they will reschedule that at some point in the future. But there are many announcements, so please, please read through them. And now we will rise as we begin our worship. Thank you. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, whose teaching is light, whose presence is sure, and whose love is endless. Let us confess our sins to the one who welcomes us with an open heart. God, our comforter, like lost sheep, we have gone astray. We gaze upon abundance and see scarcity. We turn our faces away from injustice and oppression. We exploit the earth with our apathy and greed. Free us from sin, gracious God. Listen when we call out to you for help. Lead us by your love to love our neighbors as ourselves. Amen. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. By the gift of grace in Christ Jesus, God makes you righteous. Receive with glad hearts the forgiveness of all your sins. Our 
A reading from James. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness, for all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is perfect, able to keep the whole body in check with a bridle. If we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at the ships. Though they are so large that it takes strong winds to drive them, yet they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire, and the tongue is a fire, the tongue is placed among our members as a world of iniquity. It stains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of nature, and is itself set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species. But no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it, we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives or a grapevine figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. The word of the Lord. to my supplication, for the Lord has given ear to me whenever I am called. The cords of death entangled me, the anguish of the grave came upon me, I came to grief and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord, O oh Lord, I pray you, save my life. I will walk in the presence of Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord watches over the innocent. I was brought low, and God saved me. Turn again to your rest, O my soul, for the Lord has dealt well with you. For you have rescued my life from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from stumbling. I will walk in the presence of the Lord in the land of the living. I will walk in the presence of the Gospel according to St. Mark, the eighth chapter. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. He sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter 
and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. Good to be with you again. It's been some months since I've been, I've been here. I was thinking back and chatting with Deacon Janice before the service and realized that the last time I was here, I was not in this pulpit, but rather on the parking lot. Good for us to be able to gather in God's house in the temple again, even though we need to maintain masking. I'm going to open this homily with the, opera, with the opportunity for, for uh, uh, audience, or maybe I should say congregational participation. I'll give you the first line, the first line of a familiar saying, and I'll ask you to finish the proverb by responding with the second line. You ready? Sticks and stones may bake, break my bones, but... Words will never hurt me. It's part of the folk wisdom that we share in common. But is that proverb really true? I googled it. The affirmation, the aphorism seems to have been used first in March of 1862 in an issue of the Christian Recorder, a publication of the African Methodist Episcopal Church and you will know that that is one of the historic black denominations. No explanation is provided, but a good guess is that in the context of slavery, the Civil War, and the subsequent history of racial conflict in America, it might be construed as counsel for African Americans to swallow the racial epithets as long as no physical injury is inflicted. If that, is, if that is actually the intent of the saying, then the saying is both true and not true. Words lead to deeds. Language itself holds power, including the power to hurt others. A speaker last year at the Nazareth Rotary Club was Andrea Search, Outreach Director of Turning Point of the Lehigh Valley. Turning Point is a safe place where victims of abuse and their children can find refuge. Ms. Search's talk was very informative, but the power of her presentation came when she told her own story. Her former bar partner began with belittling the remarks, and then came emotional abuse, and finally, physical violence. Or take, for instance, the riots in Charlottesville, Virginia, a few years ago. The rallying cry was, Jews will not replace us. Those were fighting words, and they did indeed call forth physical harm including at least one death. The then president, in an effort to calm the tensions, opined that there were good people on both sides of the argument, but those words only made things worse. 
social media, especially Twitter, which requires users to make statements of 280 characters or less, has set a new pattern for civil discourse. Many of us now tweet things that we previously never would have said. We are often prone to saying things without thinking first, whether online or in person. That takes us back to our epistle lesson for this evening. James addresses the human tendency to let loose talk run rampant, even in the pre-Twitter world of the first century. James wrote his Episcopal, Episcopal, let me try one more time, James wrote his epistle to Jewish Christians in a tense situation. Economic problems in the Roman world, in infighting among different factions of Jews, and the growing revolutionary resistance of the zealots in Judea had put everyone on edge. In just a few years after James wrote these words, Violence would be unleashed when the zealots un revolted against Rome in A.D. 66. It was a disaster, culminating in the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. James's concern is to help his brothers and sisters in the diaspora live with integrity and represent Christ in a world that seemed to be going to hell, quite literally. Like their ancestors in the exile of the Jews, these new Christians needed to learn how to live as aliens in a foreign land. It's little wonder then that one of James's primary concerns is the use of words. In a volatile environment, the wrong word can be the match that lights the fuse of violence, strife, and misunderstanding. The tongue is a fire, says James, that is set on fire by hell. And unlike a tweet that can be deleted, thus potentially limiting the damage, the wrong word said in the wrong situation can create an uncontrollable blaze that will consume a community and cause irreparable harm. James begins this section of his epistle by warning teachers who are really masters of words about the potential for their words to cause problems. Not many of you should become teachers, says James, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness Teachers who use bad grammar, misspell words, and give false information reveal their own incompetence. Teachers are held, understandably, to a higher standard. Of course, mistakes happen. All of us makes mistakes. And James acknowledges that. Ideally, however, we should aspire to speaking and teaching with precision. When our words are sound, then the whole body comes into line, just like a horse is controlled by a bit, a bit and bridle, and like a ship is controlled by a rudder. On the other hand, if these small controlling mechanisms are broken, they can set the whole community adrift, or alternatively, to run amok. James may be referring to rumors when he says how great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire. A misplaced word by the tongue can incite an individual or a whole body of people to violence, despair, and fear. It can bring forth a world of iniquity that sets on fire the very cycle of nature the kind of stuff that is sparked by hell itself. When our speech is under control, it has 
or when I, when I say, when I, I should say, when our speech is out of control, it has the potential to upset the entire created order. James refers back to the creation story in verses 7 and 8 when he reminds his readers that God gave humanity dominion over all the animals of the earth and all of them have been tamed. But no human has been able to tame the tongue because it's like trying to tame a venomous snake. Out of the same mouth we can bless the Lord one minute and in the very next curse another fellow human being made in the image of God. James says, my brothers and sisters, this not ought to be so. Instead, James says, we need to pay attention to the source of our words, to consider the internal thought processes, processes from which our words spring forth. If a spring is full of fresh water, it won't be pouring out undrinkable vine. A, a fig tree doesn't produce olives, nor does a grapevine produce figs, and you can't automatically get fresh water from salt water. Everything follows after its kind, James implies, and our words are the product of what's going on inside us. So rather than letting our tongues and tweets be controlled by a reptilian brain, the wise and understanding person leads a life in which actions and words emerge from a well of gentleness born of witness, the kind of wisdom that comes from above. So how can we prime the pump for that kind of wisdom? How can we tame our tongues to speak in ways that edify instead of sparking distension and destruction? Well, as James implies, it begins with considering how we think before how we speak. That's an important skill in a world where Twitter, Twitter storms and nasty rhetoric seem to be the new norm. As Christians, we need to uphold a different way of speaking that is controlled and that emerges from the deep well of God's wisdom. In other words, we need to en engage the brain and the spirit before we engage the tongue. A recent book by Baylor University professor Alan Jacobs off offers great advice for how to repair the connection between the brain and the tongue. When someone posts an outrageous tweet, we're prone to, we're prone to wonder, what were they thinking? Chances are they weren't thinking. Professor Jacobs suggests that we all need to relearn how to think before we engage the process of how to speak. In his book, How to Think, A Survival Guide for a World at Odds, Jacob seems to be building on James's advice when he offers a thinking person's checklist of good things to remember before we engage our tongues. The items on the checklist fall into three general guidelines. First, be slow. In a world of instant messages, Twitter and sound bites, it's tempting to react quickly when we're confronted with an idea or a provocation. But when we're tempted to respond quick, quickly, we should instead give it five minutes forego the need for an instant response to that nasty email or idiotic tweet. Consider not responding at all. Good and wise thinkers focus on thinking and responding about the right things, not about everything. As James said earlier in the letter, let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, 
for your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Second, be teachable. Jacob suggests that one of the reasons we are so quick to respond to things, to things in a Twitter culture is that others are watching and we want to impress our like-minded friends. We perform for them and their speech becomes coarse and even caustic. The truth is, however, that we can all learn from others, even from those with whom we disagree. The key is found in choosing good conversation partners. There are plenty of trolls out there, particularly on social media, who simply want to stir the pot but as the old adage says, don't wrestle with pigs. You only end up getting dirty, dirty and the pig enjoys it. Seek out fair-minded people with whom you disagree. Assume the best of people. Consider that you yourself might be wrong. Listen and learn in order to understand. So first, be slow to anger Second, be teachable about opinions. Third and finally, be honest. When you do speak, state what you think and believe with conviction, but draw from the well of God's wisdom and love. As James says, the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. When we speak out of that wisdom, a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. Dear Christian friends, this is helpful advice in an age when good thinking and good speaking is in short supply. Words matter, so let us think and speak clearly, whether it's with our mouths or our keyboards. Amen. Thanks be to God.
Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Made children and heirs of God's promise, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Creating God, you brought life into being and called it good. Bring new creation to lands devastated by tornadoes, hurricanes, floods, fires, and other disasters, including recent destructive events on the Gulf Coast, in New England, in the Pacific Northwest, and in Western Europe. Restore forests and curb overflowing waters. Lord, in your mercy, protecting God, you desire all people to live in peace and safety. Provide for all who are in danger. Strengthen first responders to help meet the complex needs of others. Provide care and compassion as they face trauma themselves. Be with all in your healing care. O Lord, on this day of remembrance, we cast our minds back to the events of September 11, 2001, and we pray you would bless all those who were, effect were affected. We pray for peace in the world going forward. Lord, in your mercy, forming God, you gather this community together shape our communal life, that in our prayer, praise, and worship, we honor you and encourage one another. Keep our disagreements civil and increase our joy in working together. Lord, in your mercy, redeeming God, you accompany your people through every stage of life. We give you thanks for the saints who now rest in your embrace. Lord, in your mercy, receive these prayers, O God, and those in our hearts known only to you, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always and also with you. Let us exchange with each other socially distanced words of peace.
as we come to God's table, we bring with us gifts of time and talent and treasure. We pray that God will bless them and use them for the purposes of the kingdom. There are offering plates at the entrance to receive your gift. We lift up our hearts as we give thanks and praise to our Lord, our God, who has set this Eucharist before us. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection, open to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, mighty, and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body given for you, do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory, pour out his spirit upon us, the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us, our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Taste and see that the Lord is good. As you take the bread, remember that this is the body of Christ, the bread of heaven, given for you. As you take the cup, remember that this is the blood of Christ, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Lord of life, in the gift of your body and blood, you turn the crumbs of our faith into a feast of salvation. Send us forth into the world with shouts of joy, bearing witness to the abundance of your love. In Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, Amen.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord, thanks be to God.